Well, we're going to wrap up with one, and um, we're going to be answering a question that um, sometimes we may ask, but we don't ask. Have you ever had those questions that you wanted to ask, but you just didn't ask? Have you ever had those? There's something you always want to ask. Like, man, I would give anything if I had the ability to ask what about that, but there ain't no way I'm going to ask about it. But sometimes we get these, these things that happen in church, and, and we don't ask about them. We don't find out about them, and we just kind of pass them off as one of those things about church, and it rolls in one ear, out another, right off the top of your head, just whatever, and you never really grasp what it means. You never grasp the depth of what the phrase, the situation, the saying, whatever it is, what it really means. I grew up in church, and um, in growing up in church, we have this stuff that we like to call uh, churchology. How many of y'all have ever heard phrases that fit in churchology, but just not stuff you would normally use in everyday life? And there becomes this phraseology that we do within the church. And, and to us, it's awesome because we know exactly what it means. But to people that aren't in church or maybe they don't know the gospel or don't know Jesus or maybe just don't have the background that we had or maybe they're a new convert, whatever the case may be, sometimes they hear them and they're like, I don't get what that means. You ever had that before? You ever heard somebody say something? You're like, I just, man, God bless you or something. He's like, I know who they're talking about. One of the things sometimes people, and I'll talk over just a couple of them, is um, sometimes people walk in and, and hear somebody say, Amen. They're like, what does that mean? Like, I'm sitting here enjoying this music, and this person beside me hollered out loud in church. Like, hollered back at the platform. That's weird. We don't go to a movie and holler back at the screen unless we're mad about it, right? We heckle. But here, they're acting like they're happy and they're hollering back at the stage. Well, the word amen, for those of you that don't know, basically means so be it. So be it. So if I say something that you agree with and somebody says amen, what they're basically saying is, I'm with you on that. Right on. I'm there. Amen? Come on now. I was waiting for somebody to pick up and check in on just a little bit. And it means a phrase. It means, yes, I agree with what's being said. I agree with, with the words, with the song, whatever it may be. And that's where you get this word, amen. Another one, and this is really cool because some, some church cultures take this like to the extreme. And I promise you, this is, this is not me at all. But how many of y'all have ever been in church and heard the use of the term brother? Anybody? Come on, raise your hand. If you've been in church, and you're like, amen, brother. God bless you. Good to see you this morning. Ain't God good? And you're like, huh? What did he just say? Or you ask somebody, how are you doing today? Oh, man, God's good. Hallelujah. Amen. It's just been great in my life. You're like, I just asked how you were doing today. And we hear this word, brother. We're like, what does that mean? Well, what it actually means in, in church world is, according to the scriptures, when we are saved, when we, are, um, we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, he is our heavenly father, and others who have done the same are our brothers and our sisters in Christ. So sometimes people respond and call their brother or sister, Brother Greg, or Brother Jeremy, or Sister Tara. You hear these words, and sometimes you're thinking, man, is this like, is this like a sister wife thing? Everybody's sister so-and-so. No, it's just, a, it's just a church phrase that if you don't understand, sometimes can seem really odd. I grew up in independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, uh, premillennial, just, just everything you can tag onto a church. That's what I was raised in, which was cool. But they had their own phrases that honestly will freak you out. Like, if you don't understand what they're saying and what it means... You, your eyes will get about this big. And I know this because I've seen it happen many times. Here was one saying that you probably are going to look at me like, Do people actually say that? And yes, it's true. Get this now. Here's what, it, here's what it's saying. And then I'll give you an explanation on it. I'm glad that preacher day, he preached hide on the wall, guts in the floor, and blood in the cracks. <laughs> Have y'all ever heard that one in church before? Hide on the wall. And I get a big amen. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Hide on the wall, guts in the floor, and blood in the cracks. I remember the first time I grew up in church world. I remember the first time I heard that. I went, oh, what did he just say? 
And basically, it is their churchology phrase that if you don't know about Jesus, that's going to scare the be Jesus out of you. It's their phrase that means the preacher let loose and preached against everything. Well, if he is not preaching hard, he's not skinning your hide, he's not getting to you unless he's preaching against everything. And that was their phrase to basically say the preacher preached hard on everything tonight. But if you don't understand it, it seems really, really weird. But we have this phrase we use sometimes, and we used it at this church, and I'm sure you've used it at your church, and sadly, many people don't even know what it means. And here's what the phrase is. Do you know what it means to be alive in Christ? Do you actually know what it means to be alive in Christ? Now, how many of y'all have ever heard that saying before? Be like, amen. We've had people made alive in Christ. We hear it, but do we actually even know what all that means? Or is it one of those phrases, like many others, that you hear, you look, say, amen, so be it, I agree with that, and never really grasp the fullness of what it is. I'm kind of tagging off the movie today on God's Not Dead. Many of you may have seen this movie as a Christian-based film. It came out just within the past year. It was hugely successful. Um, went all across the nation. And, and it was, you know, for, for a Christian film, it was a good film. I definitely recommend seeing it. It was, it was, it was good. And it, it brought up some good points on both sides and, and, and can give you a, a, maybe a base to understand a little bit more about God. But it focuses on this premise that God is not dead. And it's a setting in a, in a college classroom where an atheist professor is challenging the assertion that God is still alive. He's challenging the assertion that God is not dead. And he makes everybody say that God is dead if they want a passing grade or else they have to debate it. That's his, that's his theory and that's his goal is to get everyone to admit that God is a myth, the whole thing was made up, and that God did not resurrect from the dead. But our Bible, as a Christian and a believer, and as you'll see in the movie spells out, it comes down to this point called faith, where you have to believe that Jesus Christ is not dead. And if you get to that point, through not only the biblical belief, but even through historical, and I'll get to that in just a minute, through historical belief that God is not dead, then you can believe that Jesus Christ is the powerful Savior of this world. So if God is not dead and he is alive, what does it mean for me to be alive in Christ? What does that mean? There's a couple things I want to go over. I'm not going to keep you long this morning, but hopefully you'll walk away today with a renewed sense of spirit inside of you and say, I am glad I am alive in Christ. That is amazing. I did not understand what all it meant. But I am glad that I am alive in Christ. The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 4 through verse number 5. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Give an amen on that. Amen, brother. That's right. By grace you have been saved and you have made, been made alive in Christ. Now, before we can be made alive, that absolutely means one thing. One time we were dead. To be made alive meant that there was formerly no life. Today, if you're someone who has never given your faith and trust and belief in Jesus Christ as the Savior, as the resurrected king, as your Lord. Here's what the Bible basically says. Without even knowing it, you may think you're living fine, but inside, spiritually, in your heart, that longing and that peace is dead. Your sin has cut you off from God, and it has made you of no life inside. Which is why, Rich. When we go out and we try to find things that fill and satisfy, and we try to find things that are a thrill, they last a little while, but they fade. You know why? Because we're dead inside, and when we're dead, we are not made alive in Christ. We're trying to fill something inside of us where we get the feeling of being alive. 
And we're trying to gloss over the fact that we are dead. In Ephesians chapter number 2, he says, You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. You were not made alive. But then he says, by grace, you have been made alive in Christ. Here's what it means. Three things. You've got your little bullets, and I want you to write it in. Here's what being made alive in Christ means. Number one, when you accept Jesus and ask him into your life, and you pass from death unto life, that life does this. God is in you. When you ask Jesus to save you and to be your Lord, not only is it a mind comprehension, not only is it a heart comprehension, but God actually comes to live inside of you. And you say, now listen, stop right there. I can't believe that. I'm skeptical of that part right there. I There's nobody living inside of me. You mean something's inside me? I remember one time there was a lady uh, we knew in Georgia and... Um, she never had children, and, and uh, her and her husband, they, they became with child. And so she went to the doctor. She'd been having some physical difficulty, and she wasn't grasping everything. And, and when they went to the doctor, the doctor said, Ma'am, I'm happy to announce in, in so many months, you're going to have a baby. She's like, what do you mean? He's like, Ma'am, you're, you're going to have a child. You have a child growing inside of you. And she freaked out. She's like, you mean I have someone inside of me? He's like, yes. <laughs> He's like, that's weird. He's like, yeah. Just give it a couple months, it'll be okay. And so she couldn't grasp this idea that something was living inside of her, feeding off of her, nurtured inside of her. But it's that way with Christ. He comes down, and that void where it was dead, here's the thing about dead things. There's no growth. There is no life. It is just stagnant and dead. And that part of your life that's dead, searching for anything but cannot get revived and cannot get fulfilled, Jesus steps in through the power of the Holy Spirit, sends the Spirit down to indwell inside of you, and it makes you alive. Here's the cool thing about that, and I want you to get that this morning. The same Jesus that over 2,000 years ago resurrected from the heart of this earth, I talked a couple weeks ago, conquered death and hell for all of us, is the same Jesus that right now is living inside of each of our hearts. And that spirit that comes down the moment you believe and accept Christ inhabits you. And he's forever the hope of glory. His spirit comes for several things. Number one, his spirit comes for the comforter. His spirit comes for an advocate. His spirit is inside of you for a guide. His spirit is inside of you as your savior. His spirit is inside of you as your strength. His spirit is inside of you as your hope. His spirit is inside of you as your power. We are not powerless. We have the God who got up over 2,000 years ago inside of us. We should not be dead. We should not be lifeless. We should not just lay around and think, well, what's going to happen is going to happen. This world's just a bad place. No, Jesus himself who got up is inside of me. He's inside of you. That ought to make you happy, and that ought to make you alive. God is inside of us. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 27 says this, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, he's like, I'm going to make this known to all the Gentiles. you got to understand, Jesus had passed from a Jewish bride to a Gentile bride. He said, I want you to make known this very fact. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is inside of you. I got to go with the, um, the teenagers to Dollywood back in uh, July. And um, if you ever want to get saved about four times, go on a trip with teenagers. Um... You will do it. <laughs> oh, I had a lot of fun, though. I had a lot of fun. And um, so we went to Dollywood, and we went to several different places. But at Dollywood, <laughs> excuse me, it was the last day of this big show. And the title of the show was called A Gazillion Bubbles. A Gazillion Bubbles. And my first thought is, yeah, right. There's no way. So I go in, and it's this guy who did amazing things with bubbles. Everything from um, using these big hoops uh, with uh, the little, what is it, the little kids swimming pools with all the solution, and would take it and just go over somebody with this bubble that was bigger than me. And it's got to be big, be bigger than me. And he would take these bubbles and do all this cool stuff. And then he told a story where he's talking to like his little niece in Hawaii. 
And he was telling her, listen, it's not going to snow this Christmas, but I might be able to make something else happen. And the lights go out. And he's telling this story for about another minute or so. And then all of a sudden the lights come back on. And there's like 25 bubble machines running wide open. And the whole place is basically just covered in bubbles. It was the coolest thing ever. But he did one thing that really caught my attention a little bit. Because it, it ties into this message. And he's talking about that inside of you. He took a table. <coughs> excuse me. He took a table about like this. And he took this little rod, and he dipped it in some solution, smeared some solution on the table, and then blew into the rod, and he blew up a bubble about this big off this table. It was so cool. He blew up this bubble, and then he turns over and he grabs another rod, and he's actually got a fog machine on the floor, well, the little button on the floor, and he hits it, and he fills the tube with fog. And he turns around and sticks the tube inside of the bubble, takes a quick burst of air, and the bubble fills with smoke. And when he pulls the tube out, it stays inside of this bubble. So here was just a normal bubble. But with the work of the artist and the master, he inserts a little bit of smoke into this bubble. And suddenly it changes the whole complexity of the whole bubble. I'm 30. Be 31 tomorrow. Just, just to let you know. Amen. Amen, brother. I'm 30, and I know the kids designed for like five-year-olds and six-year-olds. I was enthralled. It was so cool. I was sitting there on the edge of my seat like, this is amazing. He just took a bubble, a bubble, and he filled it with smoke. And he changed everything what was the inside of that bubble. What used to be just, just nothing, the nothingness that was inside because of the work of the master, Come on now, stay with me just a little bit. Because of the work of the master, he's able to fill the inside of it. The smoke. Then he made another big bubble, and he actually threw it in the air. A big, just a big circle bubble. And took a little rod and did the same thing. And as it's falling, he, he blew another internal bubble that was a bubble by itself filled with smoke inside of this other big bubble and it wasn't touching they were both falling at the same time you gotta admit I, i'm gonna be dead serious i wish i could do it up here for y'all y'all would be enthralled everybody's like yeah me too it was so cool to see here's a bubble and inside of it's another bubble filled with smoke and it got me thinking you know what's amazing in the touch of the master's hand you take a bubble that has nothing inside of it it's just kind of lifeless. It just is a bubble. And with the touch of the master's hand and, and putting the right things inside of it, and maybe let's, let's talk to this in the spiritual sense, having Jesus on the inside, and all of a sudden what used to be just nothing suddenly has power because of God. I remember, I think back over to Isaiah chapter number 6, when God came down and met with Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 in the temple, the Bible says that the house was filled with smoke. The whole, the pillars of the, the doors moved at the sound of his glory, and his spirit came down in the midst of the smoke. And it got me thinking about that. Our lives, they just are, right? Our lives are just there. We search for anything inside we look for anything, but the Bible says that we're dead. There's nothing there. It's, it's just emptiness. But when the master, God, comes in, he can inject into our lives something that we can't do on our own. And when the spirit comes, it doesn't just, doesn't just take up one little spot. The spirit is of itself, but all of a sudden, when it goes inside, it starts spreading out. And right before you know it, the smoke covers everything. Because here's the thing. We're not supposed to give just Jesus a little piece of our life. And when we're saved, God doesn't come in and say, well, you know what? That little part, I'll take over that. Here's what he says. I am Lord of all if I am Lord at all. And when you accept me, I will come in. But have it known, you're not going to have the lifeless nothingness anymore. You have my power and you have my spirit. And it's going to fill every bit of the inside of you. That's what it means to be alive in Christ. As a Christian, Christ who is alive is alive in me, therefore I am alive. Number two, I'll move on. Not only are we alive because God is within us, we're alive because our sin is forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. Here's the amazing part about being alive. The Bible says that we're dead in trespasses and what? Dead in trespasses and sins. Our sins keep us weighted down. 
our past, our mistakes, our failures, our things we've reached for, the things we've done we wish we could redo, the times we failed. As a husband, the times we've cheated on our wife in the past. As a worker, the times we've cheated on our employer in the past. As a father, the times we failed our family in the past. As a mother, the times we turned and walked away from our kids in the past. Whatever the case may be, whatever the case may be, God's son is bigger than that. And the part about being alive is this. It's not necessary that it never happened. The part about being alive is this. God covered it and took it away. In the spiritual sense, you don't have to bear the burden of the fault and the problems that you used to have because God said, I will take that upon me. In Isaiah chapter number 53, the Bible says he bore our sorrows. He was bruised for our iniquity. And by his stripes, by his chastisement, by the fact that he took the whip, he took the cross, he took the pain, he took the suffering, he took the spirit, he took the thorns. Because of that, we are healed. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. I want to get down just a little bit the nitty gritty. Talking about healing. I want you to understand that healing doesn't mean that the thoughts and the issues never happened. I could come to somebody today. Maybe there's somebody in the, in the house today who has been healed of a, a tragic disease. Maybe someone who has been healed, let's say, of cancer. But through that healing of cancer, maybe there were some scars that you're going to have to carry because of that disease, although you're healed now. And although you're healed sometimes, you still have to battle Am I still really here? I've talked to many people who have had some kind of disease before, and they say every day you wake up and you, you wonder, am I still here? Because you just don't know. But here's what Jesus is so amazing about the healing part. Yes, you may still have some scars that you suffer because of the sin. Yes, there may be times where you wonder, am I still, why do I still battle that? Why do I still have to fight it? But Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And what that means is basically this. For every ounce of sin that you have ever bestowed upon yourself, the amount of grace is always bigger. Whatever way you took, the way he took is bigger. And it's sufficient to always walk you through. I started to do an illustration, and, um, but I want you to just kind of think about it. Think about today, I'm walking along with 50-pound backpack on me. And you, any of y'all know, 50 pound backpack is not a small thing. It, it weighs a lot. And I'm walking. For some of you techies, that's nothing. 50 pounds, that's nothing, man. You got nine notebook computers and, and all kinds of stuff, a modem and, a, and dial up. Why do you have dial up in your backpack? I don't know. Anyway, you got all this stuff and, and you walk and the weight of it changes how you walk. You may be able to go somewhere with it, but it changes the way you walk. But imagine shedding off that weight, getting rid of it, and walking without it. It does a couple things. Number one, it's easier. Life becomes so much easier when you realize the weight's gone. Number two, it changes the way you walk because you're not having to walk under the stress and under the pressure and under the load of what used to be. Your sins are forgiven. The Bible says this. In Acts chapter number 10, verse number 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive forgiveness of sins. I spoke to a lady just yesterday, and this ties in beautifully. Her husband had come back from the Vietnam War, and he suffered harsh PTSD. And at the time, they didn't know what it was. So basically, everybody at that time, all they did was drank their worries away. Young man, 17 years old, thrown into the middle of Vietnam, having to commit atrocities and see things that no 17-year-old, in my opinion, should ever have to see. No 25-year-old. War is horrible. It's tough. I understand that. But you're, here you are, a young man, impressionable, seeing, seeing just gruesome things. And it changed how he viewed life. And he'd come back home, and he never would talk about it to anyone. But what he'd do is he'd go out as a good old boy and just drink 
basically his pain away for a couple days. Go back to work for a few days and do it all over again. And when he'd come home after a night of heavy drinking, he would abuse his wife and, and abuse his kids. And, and at the time, there was basically the prevailing notion of, you made your bed, you lie in it. There was no thought of going to a shelter and seeking help or trying to get counseling. That was just something that you just did not even think about and do. And so you bear all the burdens. You bear everything upon yourself to the point where the lady says she had a mental breakdown and snapped without even realizing. She says she prayed to God, God, please, please help me in this. I can't do this on my own. He said without, without fail, God would give her strength and her husband would, would change for a little while. She said it was just enough for me to build up my strength and courage to say, you can do this. She said one day my husband went to church and went to the altar, gave his life over to Jesus, and she said, like that. So he still suffered PTSD. He still suffered from some of the problems that he had. But said who he was was forgiven. And said so he walked away from that man and walked away into walked into a new life. She said he wouldn't talk about it much, but she said we did sit down and talk about it a couple times. He said he's so ashamed of how he treated me as his wife, how he treated our children, how he treated us in the past, and the things he had done. She said he didn't know how to verbalize it. Well, you're just, he was that culture where you just didn't admit your flaws and admit your failures. She said, but God allowed me to have almost 20 years with the man who lived every day understanding that who he was had been forgiven and he was made new in Christ. And she said it was the most glorious 20 years I could ever ask for. That's the amazing part about grace today. It doesn't change then but it can change your now. Because when you accept Jesus and you are made alive, all of that sin, that past, is forgiven. God said he will take it as far away as the east is from the west, and no man to this day knows where that boundary is at Safar. He said he will bury it in the deepest parts of the ocean where you will not have to give account for your sins. Jesus took them. Number three, and I'm done. Here's the amazing part. Some of y'all don't even know. Being made alive in Christ not only mean God is in you, it actually means that your sin is forgiven. But number three, you are called now with a purpose. See, every single one of us here today, we are actually called by God to be His hands and His feet. We are not called to just be at church and to sit and do it over and over and over. God has called you exactly where you're at. See, some of y'all think, well, the work of Jesus, I, I can't work in the church, and I can't sing, and, and I can't preach, and it's not. Listen, the work of Jesus is you getting up on a Monday morning and being at work with a good testimony and a Christian attitude and a Christian spirit and doing your job the way you told the worker and the company that you would. That is being the hands and feet of Jesus by spreading what a Christian really is. Come on now. That's being in the hands and the feet of Jesus. See, we are called for something. Jesus said this about everyone. This isn't about one person. It's not about just the disciples. He said these things about everyone. He said, you are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. He said, you are a light that cannot be extinguished. You are salt of the earth and in salt it makes the presence of whatever it's on different. You are called to make a difference exactly where you're at. My ministry may be at Thrive Church preaching the gospel, but it's also out in the world. Your ministry may be showing up at work tomorrow with a good attitude and telling people that are sin sick and that don't know if someone loves them. I love you today. I'm praying for you. Maybe that's your calling. That's your purpose. But somewhere God has called you to be more than just to be. Can I say that one more time? God has called you to be more than just to be. We're not existers. We are livers. Can I say that again? You're like, what did you just call it? Yes. We are called unto life. We're not just called to exist on this earth. 
We are called with a purpose. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9. Who has saved us and called us with the holy calling. Not according to our work, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. God has called each and every one of us today. Here's the problem, though, and why I think sometimes we don't live. Most people have never been told that. Do you know most people think that the calling of God is only on those who are preachers? Some of us in the church world we grew up in, that's what it said. Well, man, that gentleman has been called by God. That gentleman has been called by God. He's a special man. No. I understand what they're saying in the preacher's sense. And man, you can make your way up. I'm almost done. But you are called by God exactly where you're at. Every man, every woman here today has been called with a holy calling to be more than just a Christian, to be more than just someone who does life as a Christian. You are called to make a difference around everyone that you're at. Your calling and purpose may be what you want it to be, but your calling may actually be what God wants for you and not what you wanted yourself. And I'll close on this one. I remember back in 2007, I'd been a businessman, sold a business, and went back to college. I went to college full-time. I wanted to pay my way through. And um, I was at Mississippi State. Many of you don't know that. Some of you do. <laughs> Talk about it all the time. And I remember going to college, and my whole dream was I want to be, I want to do business. I want to be a businessman. I want to, I want to actually get in a business. I want to fly for a company. I want to, I want a corporate type job. This is, this is what I wanted to do. And that's what I, that's what I went to college for. I wanted to be a businessman. And I remember, I was leading some youth, and I knew that was my calling at the time. You know, to, to do youth, didn't say it was, a, it was my lifetime. I think sometimes people get caught up in that, that maybe your calling now may not be your calling in five years, but serve where you're at now in that calling. And I, that's what I was doing. And I grew up in a preacher's home, and I saw a lot down through the years in church world. And I'd made up one thing in my mind, my mind. I was not going to be a preacher. I'd already made that up, wasn't I was like, I'm not going to be a preacher, man. Nope, that's my dad. See, what had happened was I had seen so many people who their dads were a preacher, and so the kids felt obligated to have to be one. And, and the parents would push the kid into it, and they never had a heart for it. And it always ended just in disaster because they were trying to say what the calling of God was instead of letting that young man find out for himself what the calling of God was. Thankfully, I had parents that never pushed us. They said, you be who God wants you to be. You go in that van, you'll never fail. And I remember, I, it was actually to the point, though, instead of just saying, well, whatever happens, happens, I got to the point, that's where I said, I don't want to be a preacher. It's not what I'm going to do. It's not my calling. I'll sing. I enjoy singing. They won't let me jump around like some of the other churches, but one day maybe they will. I remember saying I'll sing and, and do whatever. I'll play instruments. I'll do whatever. And I never want to be a preacher. Then I remember on June 6, 2009, I take you to the very spot. I'm not saying it always happens this way with everyone, but it did for me. I was riding down the road and I looked at my wife and I said, Lindsay, God wants me to do this for my life. Just out of the blue. She looked at me blinked a couple times. Are you sure? Let me tell you something, baby. I would never surrender to preach on my own. Let me tell you that right now. That's not my calling. That's not what I want to do. And here's the amazing thing about getting in my calling where God had led me to that point. That I would have never realized and I would have denied beforehand. I enjoy church and church world and loving Jesus and being a part of God. I enjoyed it. I loved it. It's what I did all my life. It was where I wanted to be. It was something I would find somewhere to serve in it. And I loved it. But until I got that call for what I was to do, did it ever become my passion? See, there's a difference. You can like and love something, but there's a difference when you have a passion. That day, June 6, 2009, something I did not ever want to do 
God instilled in me a calling and a passion for that calling that has not changed to this day. I said five and a half years ago, it is still the highlight of my life every single week to get up and proclaim the gospel of Christ because it is a holy calling where God has called me. It is my life. It is everything I live for as a Christian. So today, God has something for you to be called into. Don't be upset if it's not what you want. Can I say that again? Don't be upset if your calling is not what you think you want it to be. Because what God has called you into, he's going to give you a passion for it. No matter what you thought of it, I saw it in my life. And don't be mad if your calling is not something you want it to be. Maybe you think, well, my calling is singing. I'd love to sing. But God doesn't have that calling for your life. You follow God, not what you want, and you will be so alive in your spirit. Nothing can contain the passion that flows out of you. This morning, as we rise all over the building, I'm not going to give invitations.